Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. Let me start with this like this photograph. The Bank of Korea kept its benchmark interest rate unchanged in Governor Lee's final policy meeting. Home thoughts, there's nothing like a clear, beautiful, turquoise sea. This photograph was taken next to Menemba Atoll in Zanzibar. It's from the Travel Africa Mag. And a quite beautiful book about Zanzibar is a book called Paradise by Abdul Razak Gurna. It's set more than a hundred years ago in Muslim East Africa in the early years of the century. A boy who dreams strange dreams is taken to work for his uncle, a prosperous merchant on the coast. One of the first things he learns is that the merchant is not his uncle. Yusuf has been sold into bondage to pay his father's debt. It's a short book, but it's exquisitely written. I like this quotation of Karen Blixen, again featured by Travel Africa Manic. And this photograph by Takeshi Ishizaki, Oxford Circus Tube Station. Many a time he's had such an experience as, he's, uh, as is shown in that photograph. Political reflection, Xi Jinping standing alone this photograph is by Ali Song of Getty Images. China's nearly 30-year experiment with time-limited government is officially coming to an end. The brilliance of Xi's anti-corruption campaign was all the people targeted and really were corrupt. They were also Xi's opponents, or those he feared might become his opponents. So it is quite a dramatic development, which is not really getting as much visibility as I thought it might. And uh, in August, uh, I wrote about China rising, its parabolic rise, how it's been breathtaking, millions of Chinese have been lifted out of poverty. And China continues to expand at a pace that other big economies can only dream about. Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road program binds the world to Beijing because all the roads and railways have but one destination, and that is China. Washington, I said, has metacized into an epicenter of risk, um, and that we're now living in a bipolar or even a tripolar world, if you include Putin. Um, and then saying, apart from a few half-hearted and timid phonops, China has established control over the China Sea, it has created artificial islands, militarized those islands, and I was calling it a mind-boggling geopolitical advance any which way you care to cut it. Um, interestingly, I came across this uh, in Bloomberg. The main challenges, as I see them, are posed by the security risks of sustaining a large Chinese presence in Baluchistan. This, this is about the Gwadar port, where China again has advanced its footprint in Pakistan, where it has leased the Gwadar port for 43 years. In August 2013, I wrote a piece in it, I said, I have no doubt that the Indian Ocean is set to regain its glory days. Professor Felipe Fernandez Armesto explains why the precocity of the Indian Ocean is a zone of long-range navigation and cultural exchange is one of the glaring facts of history made possible by the reversible escalator of the monsoon. Um, this photograph, this is from 420 Diani Beach um, uh, on the Indian Ocean, a photo I took over the Christmas period. And the next photograph is of Maputo from the sea, which is also the Indian Ocean. The diplomat has an article, Welcome to the New Indian Ocean. The strategic environment of the Indian Ocean is changing fast. In the last few years, we have seen growing strategic rivalry 
between major powers such as China and India as they expand their roles in the region. We are now also seeing new players competing to build their own areas of influence and blocks in the Indian Ocean. Uh, saying these developments may presage the beginnings of a new Indian Ocean strategic order, a much more complex and multipolar region where a number of major and middle powers jostle for influence and position. Although the United States remains the biggest military power in the region, it will increasingly need to deal with a much more complex environment, one in which it will not always have a leading role. China is now moving faster than many expected to build a military role in the Indian Ocean. This includes the development of a network of naval and military bases around the Indian Ocean littoral, starting with Djibouti, opened last year, and a new base likely to, build, to be built at or near Gwada in Pakistan. Further Chinese bases are likely in East Africa and perhaps in the central eastern Indian Ocean. India is particularly alarmed by the growing Chinese presence in the region and is responding. This includes building forward operating bases or staging facilities in India's own Andaman and Nicobar Islands near the Malacca Strait, as well as in island states such as the Seychelles and Mauritius. The recent finalization of a logistics exchange deal between India and France also potentially opens up French facilities in the Western Indian Ocean, such as Djibouti and Reunion, for use by India. The latest development is a deal between India and Oman, under which the Indian Navy will have access to the port of Dukrim in Oman for logistics and maintenance deal may also include the development of oil storage facilities. China's moves and the US and Indian responses have led some analysts to worry <coughs> about a new Cold War brewing in the Indian Ocean. China is not the only new factor in the Indian Ocean. Several new non-traditional players have become active in the region, which may make the regional security environment much more complex than in the past. These include regional middle powers such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, Turkey and Iran, which have played little or no security role in the Indian Ocean in modern times. We are currently seeing a race by new players such as Saudi Arabia, UAE and Turkey to build naval and military bases right across the Horn of Africa. Saudi Arabia has recently finalized uh, Saudi Arabia has recently finalized a deal to establish a naval base in Djibouti. UAE has built <coughs> major naval and air facilities at Assad in Eritrea and runs a training center in Mogadishu, Somalia. <coughs> the confluence of these factors is pushing the Indian Ocean towards a much more multipolar and complex strategic environment, unlike the Pacific remains a fundamentally bipolar strategic environment plus the North Korea problem. The Indian Ocean theatre is becoming much more multipolar. This includes major powers such as the US, India, China, clutch of Western aligned middle powers such as Australia, France and Japan, new middle powers including UAE, Saudi Arabia, Turkey and Pakistan, and over time Iran and Indonesia. Some of these new middle powers may not necessarily be hostile to U.S. interests, at least for now, but all of them will ultimately pursue their own interests and agendas. I thought that was a very good article. Something I touched on in August 2013 when I said a sine qua non of President Obama's pivot to Asia is U.S. NATO power projection over the Indian Ocean, which is what China is pushing back against. Moon River, this is the uh, uh, president of South Korea's Pyeongchang propaganda coup, says the diplomat. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in has been the real winner of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games so far. Many analysts have focused on Kim Yo jongs visit to South Korea and Pyongyang's alleged propaganda blitz. 
However, it is Seoul that has really set the agenda in recent weeks as far as inter-Korean relations go. And Seoul now sits in the driving seat of Korean Peninsula affairs. Recent diplomatic moves around the Pyeongchang Games have thus actually been moves of propaganda coup. Months of hard work have been rewarded with a diplomatic victory for the Moon government in terms of soft diplomacy in the sight of both Korea's marching together during the opening ceremony under the unified Korean flag was a powerful and moving image. It was not the first time they have marched together, but it was more meaningful because it took place on South Korean soil. Moon's propaganda coup is thus probably leading us to a period in which Seoul will dictate North the Korean Peninsula developments. This will be giving talks and engagement and chance. Whether this will have any significant impact is yet to be seen, but the Pyeongchang Games have served to open a window of opportunity that the Moon government would like to take advantage of. 12th of February, I wrote a piece, Kim Yo Jong cuts through the noise. Um, discuss these various parts but that sense that it's actually Moon River who's the puppet master is an interesting one. The road to Tehran goes through Damascus. Hope Hicks is scheduled is scheduled to be interviewed privately by the House Intelligence Committee, officials say. Ivanka Trump on her father's accusers, I think it's a pretty inappropriate question to ask a daughter if she believes the accusers of our father when he has affirmatively stated that there's no truth to it. Saudi King sacks his military chiefs in a major shake-up. Currency markets, let's take a look. Euro dollar 123.26, dollar index 89.81, Japanese yen 106.90, Swiss franc 0.9378, the pound, uh, where's that? 139.58, the Australian dollar 0.7846, India rupee 64.805, South Korean won 1073.17, Brazilian real 322.38, Egyptian pound 17.6807, South African rand close to three year high 11.56.76. The yen has climbed 5.5% this year and reached a 15-month high of 105.55 on February the 16th. Dollar index, I think it's a little bit of a buy here because of the higher interest rate structure. Last trading at 89.81. It does a stop just below 88. Euro dollar, 123.28 last. This is a three-month chart. 125.60 remains key overhead resistance. Global tech set a record. NYSE FANG plus index, which covers Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, plus six other leaders, including Chinese favorites Alibaba and Baidu, is up 20% year to date. Gold, let's take a look at where that is. 13.33 area. We've sort of met some a wall of resistance at 13.50, but people started nibbling once we got back down to 13.20. Russia were big buyers. U.S. crude oil futures settled at $63.91, trading a little bit below that level this morning. Explainer how the Punjab National Bank says it fell victim to India's biggest loan fraud. Do take a look at that. Sub-Saharan Africa. Press release, refusal by some leaders to hand over power is a letter that the Botswana government have written. Pretty powerful stuff, but they tend to be an outlier in these matters. South Africa's Ruivakes may soon leave the UN mission in the DRC, according to highly placed sources. In the South African National Defence Force, Ruivak attack helicopters deployed to the UN mission in the DR Congo may end this year following a request received from the United Nations to repatriate them as part of cost-saving measures. Inside South Africa's new cabinet, the new deputy president is David Mabuza, former school teacher. Mabuza served as premier of the eastern Mpumalanga province since 2009 
He was elected as the ANC's deputy president at a party conference in December after helping Ramaphosa win the top party post. Widely known by his initials DD, Mabuza has been accused of helping to rig state tenders and having his opponents in Mopalanga silenced accusations he has denied. He fills a post previously held by Ramaphosa. People aren't sure about that choice. Finance Minister, no one's going to agree, uh, disagree with that. Uh, Nene, Minister of International Relations, Lindiwe Sisulu, Public Enterprises Minister, Pravin Gorda, Mineral Resources Minister, Gwede Mantashi, Energy Minister, Jeff Rodavi. So, a bit of a mixed bag. It obviously, it couldn't have pleased everybody. If the uh, deputy is problematical, Malusi Gigaba, who's returned to the Home Office, tweeted, Good morning. Well, he might. It's like 1994 again, South African CEOs hail Ramaphosa win. This is like 1994 again for me, and I've been through both. I was excited about this when he finally became president as I was standing in the queues voting in 1994. The piece I wrote in December was Will It Be 1994 all over again? South African all shares down 1.07% year to date. The currency hit 11.51 versus the dollar yesterday. It's firm since February 2015. Here is a six month dollar rand chart. I think we're heading towards 11 and then maybe even 10. Oil rich Nigeria's fuel scarcity weighs on Buhari's popularity. Lines of cars and trucks snaking around blocks in the center of the Nigerian capital of Uja highlight the state's failure to fix a problem that's bedeviled Africa's biggest oil producer for decades, fuel shortages. A new round of gasoline scarcity that's gripped Africa's most populous nation since December comes at a bad time for President Omari's government. During his campaign to win office in 2015, he promised to solve the problem three years of his four-year tenure gone and elections looming next year, there's little sign he will. Nigeria confirms 110 schoolgirls are missing after a Boko Haram attack. They are set to release fourth quarter uh, and 2017 GDP, GDP figures this morning. Bloomberg consensus forecast is for Q4 growth to come at 2% year on year. Nigerian all shares up 11 percent this year. The Ghana Stock Exchange is up a whopping 29.28% this year. I like this photograph. Glow campus gaze down on the lava lake of Mount Nyiragongo in Virunga National Park, the DR Congo. My piece over the weekend was about the government selling $2 billion worth of euro bonds. Um, and I was discussing a number of issues. Uh, I still think they're going to tap. So we're going to sell more. Rezia Khan told the FT that the need for fiscal consolidation is fully realized in the finance ministry. Um, talked about the IMF, talked about uh, debt trap diplomacy, and plenty more. And then we learned Senegal is joining the African European party. It's going on a US and European roadshow for a sale of 10 and 30 euro in dollar debt from Wednesday. Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire also want to issue soon. Egypt, Nigeria and Kenya have already done so this year. The gross public debt increased 746.7 billion shillings, uh, increased by 746.7 billion from 3.82 trillion to 4.57 trillion. Mountain of debt comprises 51.9% of foreign loans and 48.1% of domestic loans. Longhorn Publishers reported first half earnings per share declined 16.667%. Sales were down 24.939%, 513.46 million. Gross profit was down 11.769%. Operating expenses were down 11.818%. Half-year profit was down 11.515%. Profit after tax was down 16.3%. Cash was 
and cash equivalents at the end of the period was 13 million point two six eight million no interim dividend EPS first half EPS of 10 cents a share versus 12 cents last time in the company commentary they talked about turnover dropping by 25 percent attributed to the new government textbook procurement framework which resulted in a shift in the buying a shift in the buying pattern from Q2 to Q3 of our financial year improvement in our operational efficiency and focus on high margin products they're going to their newest market Senegal and they're saying digital learning continues to grow exponentially they have really expanded their geographical footprint. There is a second half skew, and I thought it was quite a bullish comment uh, that accompanied those results. Nairobi all shares up 5.51% year to date. Kenjen, which recently reported its first half earnings, um, surged about 4. Point something percent yesterday, um, and, and on very, very strong volume. Uh, the share price data, the earnings are all on rich wrap ups. I said that their growth curve is intact with geothermal and steam leading the way. NSE 20 down 0.21% year to date. Governor Nanok, who's the head of the Council of Governors, and it was a pleasure making his acquaintance in person yesterday when I visited his office. Once again, thank you for stopping.